All right, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read from verses 1 through 10 today. <clears throat> and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace <clears throat> you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. All right, today's topic is so important, uh, and I do want to encourage you to really listen carefully. Um, what we're going to learn today is the amazing intricacies of conversion. And that is the topic of this chapter, uh, conversion. Okay, uh, <clears throat> For the believer, the day that you are transformed um, is the most significant moment in your life. We call this the day of our salvation or the day that we were uh, converted. Uh, it's the day when the Lord uh, saved us and made us into new creatures in Christ and gave us his Holy Spirit to reside in us and make us heaven bound. It's the day that we were released from the bondage uh, to sin and, ex and we were granted an escape from the wrath of God and it was the day that we were reconciled back to our God for and forgiven of all of our sin. It's really the most joyous day, okay? Conversion, the topic of this should be should produce joy. Uh, and and on, a, on a daily basis, you should be joyous. It, it is the most joyous day of our life. Uh, next to next to either getting married, you know that's one of the greatest joys, having children, and ultimately you know going into uh, going to heaven. But sadly, there are many who have absolutely no idea of this joy, or even if they're converted or, or not. Um, it, it's strange. Uh, it's a strange thing. People in the church walk around not knowing if they're saved, hoping that they're saved, but they're not. And, and usually it's those who don't see conversion as the most wonderful aspect of their life. Um, Becoming a Christian now has been so overly simplified to, you know, just believe. Just believe and you will go to heaven, okay? And if you have a hard time believing, let me give you scientific facts. And if you hold to these scientific facts, it will convince you in order to believe in Christ. Uh, I just listened to Tim Keller this past week. Uh, he's got these little clips of like these messages and I was just like so fed up. He was just, he was saying, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about this and that. All it says is just believe, just believe and you will be saved without any content. Um, as if to say, if you just believe, everything is okay. Um, <clears throat> it's no longer about the joy of being reconciled back to God, but simply trying to convince someone that they need to believe so that they can get their eternal life for themselves. And the result, I believe, is this, that the church is no longer filled with joyous people. The church is no longer filled with happy people. Think about this for a moment. Today, we have the church filled with people that are anxious, you know, worried, uh, troubled in their conscience. They're struggling with their emotions. 
But in reality, if the church is a gathering of converted people who are who are rejoicing of their conversion or their reconciliation back to God, relief from the condemnation of sin and shame, they've been forgiven, reconciled, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. They're one with Christ, one with the church. Their eternity is secure. These are people who would be so happy and joyful because of the new life that we have been given. But we don't have that. See, in that sense, the church or the gathering of converted people is to be the most joyous and happiest place on earth who are always expressing thanksgiving for our salvation by grace. But why isn't it like that? Well, one reason I think is because they have no idea how to understand conversion. The, the theology of conversion, the doctrine of conversion. Um, you know, when I was preparing for this, I, re I realized maybe the church, uh, or I'm, I'm talking about the church in general, there's many who are like the walking dead, the zombie, you know, the zombie apocalypse. They're dead people, but they're walking around. And if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, that's exactly what it says. It says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. Dead in the spirit, yet walking physically. And, and the strangest thing is that these zombies, these, these professing believers who are actually zombies, are convinced that they most likely are saved or thinking that they're saved when they're not. So let's clarify right now. Being converted is being saved. Being saved is being converted. Okay? The church is a gathering of converted people, not a gathering of just people. You don't have a church by getting a bunch of people together. You have a church when there are conversions. Okay? You add to the ministry through conversion. And so let me just give you a brief definition uh, of conversion. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit and saving a sinner from the wrath of God and transforming that sinner into a child of God. Okay? Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit and saving a sinner from the wrath of God and transforming that sinner into a child of God. That is conversion. And so this conversion is the event of your life. Where you were made alive in Christ, it should be the greatest and most wonderful time to reflect upon. And it is something you should be well aware of and know exactly if and when it happened. And that's what chapter 2 is about here. It, it reveals to us what happens when a person is converted so that you will know if you're converted or not. Now, let's take an overview of Ephesians before we jump in. As I told you, Pretty much every single chapter mentions something about the church. So when we talk about conversion, we're talking about conversion into the church. You can't separate your salvation in Christ outside of the church. Everything is joined together. Ephesians 1, 22-23, He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all, uh, over all things to the church, which is His body. Chapter 2, 20, uh, it refers to the church as uh, Jesus Christ as being the cornerstone. The church is a building that's being built. Chapter 3, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church. Glory, to Him be the glory in the church. <clears throat> in chapter 4, verse 4, there's one body, that's the church, one spirit. Chapter 4, verse 16, the whole body, with every single joint supplies that's all the members of the church causes the growth of the body. Ephesians 5.25, just as Christ loved the church, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. Um, and lastly, chapter 6, verse 18, with, uh, there's a spiritual war going on. So there's the church must be in prayer uh, at all times, in the spirit, with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, the saints who make up the local church. Okay. 
So again, you cannot talk about conversion without the, 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 the intricacies of being involved in the local body. But again, we're not going to really talk about the church today, uh, but, but just understand that conversion involves uh, you being involved in the church. Now, let me give you a general outline of each chapter. And I titled it this way. Uh, chapter 1, Predestined into the Church. Uh, chapter 2, Resurrection into the Church. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, the Glory of God through the Church. Chapter 3, uh, Unity and Love in the Church. Chapter 4, The Practice of Love in the Church. Chapter 5 and Chapter 6, A Spiritual Battle of the Church. Now, if you look at chapter 2 specifically, we're going to break it down into three parts. Uh, resurrection. It's all about resurrection. Okay, we might as well call conversion, you know, resurrection. You know, how, are you converted or we should be asking, are you resurrected? Okay, so resurrection into the church, it is done by the grace of God into good works and resurrection into unity. Okay, and we're going to look at that. But we'll look at the first one, I think, today, and we can break that further down into some more subpoints. Okay, resurrection by grace, uh, verses 1 through 9. Um, this resurrection by grace destroyed the power of sin. The resurrection by grace delivered us from the wrath of God. It demonstrated is demonstrated by His great love. And lastly, now this, this last one, I had to find the D word, so I just put it here as documented by faith. Okay, um, so we'll take a look at each one. Uh, the resurrection by grace, uh, His grace as He resurrects us, it destroys, um, number one, we'll look at this one, the power of, of sin. All right, let's take a look at verse one. Verse one says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what Paul is trying to do in verses one through three is to show the power of sin and what that does to us, okay? And ultimately, at the end, you realize that's what God destroyed. Well, what he's going to do is go deep into the power of sin. Notice the phrase, and you were. Okay? And you need to stop there and consider this for a moment. You were. This is referring to our past. The past in our unconverted state. And, and what, what, what I'm trying to say is this, that there's a definite break from an old self. Okay? In other words, there should be a clear indication. So when we say, or when Paul says to the Ephesians, you were, everybody knew what, the, what he meant. You were like this, and now you're like this. You were unsaved, and now you are saved. Okay? There's a definite change from the old self to the new self. And this is where people have such a hard time, especially those who are brought up in the church, they don't know when that happened. And I don't think that's good. I mean, I hear churches giving testimonies where they would accept testimonies of people who grew up in the church. Their testimony will sound something like this. Um, I was blessed to be part of a Christian home. My parents were believers, and I just grew up believing. And today, I, I stand before you to profess faith in Christ. And then they get baptized. I don't think that's right. Why? Because of chapter 2, verse 1. And you were. He's not saying, oh, you know, this only applies to the Ephesians who never heard the gospel. But if you're part of a Christian family and you grew up believing, you know, this one doesn't apply to you. Because you're always believing. All you need to do now is just stand and profess faith in Christ. <coughs> That's not right. That can't be right. Because chapter 2 verse 1 is referring to not just the Ephesians, but everyone. At one point in our life, we were. Does that make sense? At some point in our life, whether we're brought up in a Christian family or not, we understood that aspect that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Okay, I think we all know this by now, but nobody is saved by birth. You don't, you're not saved from the moment that your, your mom was pregnant with you and you start to believe that you had like, what, I think Koreans call it what prenatal faith, which is 
absurd. They're like, yeah, I believed in my mother's womb. No, you did it. Okay. And so you have to know that if, if you say you're a Christian, that you've been converted, when Paul says you were dead, you, you should be able to relate to that. You can't say, well, I was always believing. Okay. I mean, that's true. You always believed. I always believed, you know, that God existed. But I also can say that when I read this verse and you were dead, I know exactly when I was not, I was dead and when I became alive in Christ. Everyone is born dead in sin. There's a point when you come alive in Christ and that transformation is so obvious you will know meaning if you don't know you have not been converted okay conversion is the start of a completely new powerful life it's not just a reformation of an old life that gets slightly better as you grow you should be able to hear those words and you were dead, and you know exactly what Paul is talking about. You know the time when you were dead, and now you are alive. You, now again, you might, you might not know the exact moment, the time, and the, the minutes, and the seconds of that, but you know at that point in your life in the past, that happened. You can say with Paul, yes, I remember when I was dead. Now, the word dead, let's just kind of think about this for a moment. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's not like a theological term. Everybody knows what dead is. It's, it's immediately we think about a dead physical person. Um, the word dead, you know, in the Greek, necros, uh, necros, where we get like necromancy, things like that, lifeless, deceased. But we know Paul is using a, an actual word of physically dying, to make an analogy with spiritual death. Um, that before becoming a Christian, a person might be physically alive, but they're dead in sin. Okay. Now, well, what does that mean? Well, I think we can just list some obvious ones, right? Dead means um, cannot, you know, cannot save oneself, right? Uh, cannot heal oneself. Um, Cannot respond to stimulus, right? You, you, a dead person is just dead. They're, they're lifeless, okay, um, to whatever extent. Now, but Paul describes it differently. Uh, while these are true, and yes, these are actually, you have to keep this in mind, but notice what Paul says here. He says, deadness in spirituality is revealed with walking it says you were dead in your trespasses and sin okay in which you formerly walked uh the word trespass means a violation of moral standards it's like making a false step into uh into something you're not supposed to get into you know when you see those signs do not trespass it means do not cross that line that border into someone else's territory Trespassing would be something like you you went beyond what God restricted you from going, like Adam and Eve, don't eat that fruit, but you went and took that fruit, that's trespassing. Uh, sin uh, generally just means missing the mark, um, missing the goal, or falling short of, of God's glory. Okay? Now, when Paul says you're dead in trespasses and sins, the, the Greek syntax there's two ways to take this. One would be causal, meaning these cause the death. Okay, Because you sin, because you trespass, it causes a spiritual death state. But we don't think that's what he's referring to. Um, other commentators will say that this dative is lo locative or locative or it refers to location. It's kind of like saying this. It's kind of weird. It was really difficult to understand at first, but this idea, it's this idea that dead, the deadness of your life is in the sphere or the location of trespasses and sin. In other words, I guess you can picture like this. If this was the sphere of sinning, 
you will find that there's a dead person or the dead person um, re resides in the sphere or the location of sinning and trespassing or in other words sinning and trespassing is an indication that you are what that you are dead and that's how that's how they explain it okay meaning you're not sinning because i'm sorry you're not dead because you sinned and you made it some error or you trespassed you sin because you were dead you're born dead in sin <clears throat> So your dead state is found in the sphere of trespasses and, and sin. So if you find someone trespassing and sinning, you will find a spiritually dead person. So in verse 2, Paul says, You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in verse 2, in which you formerly walked. And notice again the clear break. You formerly walked. A clear break from the past, a clear indication. Again, <clears throat> that's why I really don't think it's right to say, I don't know when I got saved, but I grew up in a Christian family and I just believed all my life. I, that just doesn't make sense anymore because of this text. Paul is saying there was a time when you stopped walking in the sphere of sin. Because if you're, if you're not in the sphere of sin anymore, you're no longer dead. If you're walking in sin and you're walking in trespasses, it indicates you are dead. But Paul says here, but you formally did this. You did this, you did this in the past, but not anymore. Now, let me clarify something here. Okay. When we when Paul says you formally walked, he's talking about someone who's living in sin. He's not talking about occasional sin. Okay. He's not talking about occasional sin. Okay, So when Paul says you formally walked, he's not saying, oh, you formally occasionally sinned. The idea of walking has this idea of lifestyle. You're completely in that life. You walk in it. Meaning, after you're converted, and you occasionally sin, that does not mean you're dead. Okay? So when, you're, you, when you become a believer, and you're converted, and you struggle with sin, that is not the same thing as you formerly what? Walked. Are you guys with me? Yeah. So sometimes Christians can be tempted back to some of their old former sins, but it's not they're walking in it. They just stumble into it and they need to get out quickly. Walking in it means living in it. Okay? We all at one point lived like that. But when we were resurrected, we stopped. We no longer walked in darkness okay? because we were given a new life. Now, think how interesting this is. Because if you tell me that a person who goes to a church all their life, she was brought, he or she was brought up in a Christian family, and they can't figure out when they were saved, and the church says, you know, it's okay right now though, do you profess faith in Christ? They're like, I do. He's my Lord and Savior, and then they baptize him by, by faith. Well, think about it. Paul himself admits that he too formally, look at verse 3, among them, we too all what? Formally. Paul wasn't, I mean, when you read the description about this past, right? Lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You're thinking of someone who's like lost in drunk, um, debauchery, dissipation, uh, immorality. Paul was not like that. He grew up very, very austere, very strict, very noble, very dignified. He studied. He was the most righteous young man you could possibly meet. And yet, he himself is able to say, I see a clear distinction of my former self and my new self. Okay. 
When Paul says to the Ephesians, you formerly walked, he means you were completely living in that life of sin. It could mean that they were, there was no desire to really turn away from the sin. There is no reality that that action was hostile toward God. There was no desire to stop sin for the sake of God's glory. Like for Paul's sake, he wanted to stop sinning, but it was for his own glory. It was to be the Pharisee of all what? Of all Pharisees. So what I'm saying is, sometimes a righteous young man or woman can eagerly desire not to sin, like Paul, but it's, it's because of his lust of his glory of his life. But he's not doing it for the glory of God. And Paul says, we too all what? Formally. Okay? He can clearly see that despite all the external righteousness in his life that he had, it was clear to him it was a life of darkness. He walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the son's of disobedience. <coughs> so, does conversion, is it clear? Is this, is this something that is a mystery? No. Okay, when the Lord converts you and, and brings you to life, you will know clearly if you were brought from death into life. Now, notice what Paul goes into here. He says, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He's basically saying, he used to follow after Satan. Now, think about that for a moment. When he was young, did he think he was following after Satan? No. He thought he was serving Yahweh of the Old Testament. But Paul is saying, I used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's a reference to Satan, okay? the prince of the power of the air. Jesus himself calls uh, Satan in John 16, 11, the ruler of this world. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 12, and we saw this before, <clears throat> but you'll notice that Paul lists out these levels, these rankings of spiritual beings verse 12 for our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers powers against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places these are not government rulers they're not men these are spiritual rulers in the spiritual realm a dead person is someone who follows after the system of this world. And notice when you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, at the end of verse 2, he says, The spirit, these demonic spirits are working in the sons of disobedience. Of the, of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. They're children of disobedience. They're not children of God. They're children of, uh, of Satan who, who is disobedient, who re, who's rebellious against God. Um, if you look at the word working, right? Do you see that? The spirit that is now working. This is the same word, energeia, where we get the word like energy. It's the same word found in Ephesians 1.19. And there, it's referring to the power of God working in us. Look at verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working. You guys see that? The energy working of the strength of his mind which we which he brought about in Christ when he raised it from the dead so the power of god working to raise jesus from the grave okay it energizes christ 
to resurrect him from the grave is the same word found here, but he refers to Satan energizing the sons of disobedience. It means this, while the power of God works in the elect, the power of Satan is working in those who are not saved. You got to realize there's no like middle ground. There's no like safe middle ground where no one is touching you. You're either being worked in on by the power of God becoming more like Christ or you are being worked on by Satan who's pushing you toward disobedience. And that's really the distinction between Christians and non-Christians. Christians are children of obedience. Unbelievers are children of disobedience. Now again, keep this in mind that, that Paul hourly obeyed the Old Testament, but before God, he was still disobedient because he did not do God's will the right way. So when we are not submitting to the scripture, we are being disobedient. This is why true believers want Bible teaching more than anything. Think about this for a moment. Children of God want to obey God the right way. And so when there is good Bible teacher, you want to go and listen. There is a drawing of your heart to anything that's biblical. Because it moves you toward becoming obedient in the right way. You don't want to be obedient in your own way. Paul is clearly an example of that. He was a Jewish young rabbi. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the, the, pro, the, the, the prominent uh, prodigy of, of all the Jews. He was so young, so just prestigious. He was so strict with his life. He, he, he obeyed every single one of those laws outwardly. <clears throat> he thought he was obeying God. You understand? But in God's eyes, he was not obeying the word of God, the, the right interpretation. That's why converted people love God's word. Or just if you reverse that, when you love the word of God and the teaching and you want to obey it, it is an indication you are a child of God. Only children of God want to be obedient to his word. But children of Satan are sons of disobedience. And look at verse 3. Again, notice again, that's the power of sin. Okay, The very power of sin is that Satan's power is working in the sons of disobedience, pushing them to disobey God and working this in them. And look at verse 3. Among them we too all okay again the third time do you guys see this third time he's saying it is a clear break okay there's a clear indication it's formally but notice he says we the first two times he says you here he says we to all and commentators will point out that he's putting himself and all the jews in this we. He's telling the Jews, you're not off the hook. Just because you're born from Abraham, you are not off the hook here. You too were like this. We all were like this. He's telling the Ephesians, we're no different. Every single one of us were sinners before God, and this is what we were like. Now, before we jump in, just understand this. If Paul says he's like this, or he used to be, he says all the Jewish people are like this, and all the Ephesians are, are or were like this, then that means we too were at one point like this. Meaning, if after we read this and we explain it, and you say, yes, that was me, that's a pretty good indication that you were converted. But as, as I'm going through this, and you're like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I don't think I'm that indulgent in my flesh. I'm not that lustful. I mean, okay, sure. You know, I, I fell in that lust once in a while, this and that, but I don't think I'm that, you know, I, I, I don't, if you have a hard time admitting that that too was formerly who you were, 
then it means you're still dead. Because dead people can't understand that they're actually dead. Does that make sense? There's times when I evangelize to people and I, I would explain this to them and they're like, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if that happened because I mean, I have always believed, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, they're, they're really humble about it. They're not saying like, I've never sinned, but, but yeah, that description, like, yeah, I don't know. I just, it's, it's hard for me to relate. And then I would tell them that means you're still in sin, but when you say that, you would want them to be like, Oh, I'm dead in sin. Save me, you know? But they're like, okay. Like It just kind of goes in one year and they're not really sure how to process it because the Holy Spirit hasn't opened their eyes yet. So look, look what Paul says. He says, Among them, we formerly lived okay, or walked in the lust of our flesh. Epithemia, that's the word for lust. It means strong inclinations and desires of every sort in the physical sense. So fleshly lust. Okay, And this includes everything above. Everything included with lust. Yes, it includes the whole immoral part, the sexual desires and all that. But it goes beyond that. Pride. Anything that deals with the lust of the flesh. Pride of lies. Life boastfulness, anger, rage, worry, anxiety, uh, depression, just make the list. Anything that, that you go through in the, in, the, in the fleshly sense, in the human sense, fighting, envy, jealousy, self-esteem, glory, attention, significance. Basically, the flesh... Okay, is pulling your life versus Romans 12.1. What does Romans 12.1 say? You should know this by now. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your what? Your bodies, your flesh, okay, as a living and, and pleasing sacrifice, you know, to God. Meaning, your old self, your body was not devoted to the Lord. As a Christian, you submit that body, that flesh to God, that it will be unto Him. But an unbeliever, uh, a dead person, is one who is consumed, he's living in the lust of our flesh. Basically, it's a body not placed in submission to God. Glory, I mean, just... You can list whatever, glory, recognition, honor, uh, pride, um, pleasure, greed, uh, all kinds of dissipation, debauchery, drunkenness, partying, carousing, okay? And, and notice, uh, in, in the NASB, it says indulging. Okay? Indulging the desires of the flesh. Now, I think the NASB um, um, <coughs> interpret this as someone who's like overly indulgent in that, um, or they thought that Paul was referring to someone who who's he was yielding to his flesh, but not just occasionally, but like indulging in it, like greedily wanting more. Um, the the Greek word kind of implies that but that's not really what it means um like if you i think the esv says carrying out okay um the greek word oh i see um king james version fulfilling the greek word is poieo it means uh doing something to get it done so indulging might be implied Okay, but we're not saying like you just greedily, you know, just you know, do whatever you want to do. The idea is this, you're led by your flesh, your flesh desires certain things, and you find your flesh carrying it out, meaning you actually put it into action. You go after that which you desire. Okay. 
And the word desire, indulging the desire, uh, means strong <coughs> willfulness, diligence. Okay? You, you go after it with diligence. Um, when, 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 when a sinner wants what his flesh wants, he makes it happen. He goes about and plans and basically brings about the desire in, in its fulfillment. And then Paul goes deeper into the mind uh, at this point. To again, he's revealing the power of sin that 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 God destroyed. But notice how powerful this is. We're, we used to be led by our flesh. We carried out the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So now we have flesh and the mind working together. The flesh and the mind. Uh, the mind completely in defiance against God. There was no real desire to submit to God. And I think for someone who doesn't, who's never gone to church, yes, you might say like he just hates God. He doesn't believe in God. He believes in evolution and things like that in his mind. And he's just, just defiant. But in terms of like, someone who grew up in a church or grew up in a Christian family, it might look something like this, that his mind is set on self-esteem and glory and boastfulness of his spirituality. His mind, he thinks he's, it's set on pleasing God, but ultimately, like Paul, he's set on pleasing his own self receiving attention from men, and being acknowledged that he's mature. But the mind is set against God. And it's amazing, because when Paul says, we too, and if he didn't say that, we would think it's, all, it's just completely about someone who's just completely, like, outrightly sinful, but... Remember, Paul was <coughs> very, uh, <coughs> very righteous, very upright. I don't think anyone would have doubted his, his faith in Yahweh. And yet Paul says, when I look back, I was just led by my flesh. I indulged, I carried out the desires of the flesh. Which is kind of hard to imagine, right? Like, because everything just sounds so negative. But the point is this if you are converted, you will be able to relate to that phrase. You will be able to say, Yeah, I too formerly lived in the lust of my flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh, and my mind, my mind was not obedient to God. Like, you, you should. You will see that if you are saved. But if you're not converted, you won't be able to distinguish this. And that's the point. See, studying this passage is to help people in the church who are not converted to get converted soon. To realize that conversion has not happened. You are still dead in sin. And trespasses. Now, when you're resurrected, all of that is completely destroyed. Okay? And that's the point. The resurrection that we go through is by the grace of God. And number one, it destroys the power of sin. And number two, it delivers us from the wrath of God. It delivers us from the wrath of God. Look at, verse, look at the second part of verse 3. We were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And notice what Paul says. We're by nature children of wrath. Okay? Children of wrath. Not children of God. Children 
of wrath. And again, this is very significant for Paul to say this to the Jews because they all thought they were children of who? Abraham. Paul says, no. Paul says, no, every single one of you, whether you're Jews or you're, you're the Gentile Ephesians in the church, we were all formerly children of wrath. We were not children of God. Wrath is what we expected. Wrath is what we feared. And if you are converted, you will know this. The reality of God's wrath will be so clear, meaning it was once the most fearful thing, now it's not. We once were children of what? Children of wrath. Think about that. Uh, Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, that this wrath is not to be compared in, to fire and straw, quickly blazing, quickly burnt out. On the contrary, it is, it is settled indignation. The attitude of God toward men viewed as fallen in Adam and refusing to accept the gospel of grace and salvation in, in Christ. A.T. Robertson says this, Paul is insisting that Jews as well as Gentiles are the objects of God's wrath because of their lives of sin. The Jews had a hard time realizing that they're children of wrath. I turn with me to Romans 2 and, and just kind of sense the urgency in Paul's tone here as he's trying to convince the Jews who are so righteous, self-righteous, they, they, the thought of being under the wrath of God was like foreign. You know, okay, okay, maybe occasional anger of God. You know, like when you sin, oh my gosh, God is going to do something. You know, that's more of like a fear of immediate punishment. But, but the settled idea that you are under his righteous anger, it was foreign to the Jews. And it might actually be foreign to you. But for those of us who are converted, we know, we look back, we knew that reality. And that's what caused us to believe. Like, look at chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 11. Therefore, you have no excuse. I'm sorry. Therefore, you are without excuse. Every man of you who passes judgment. He's talking to the Jews. For, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Or do you suppose this, O oh man? And it's referring to the Jew. When you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, you will receive wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to every man who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Do you guys hear? Can you guys, can, can, can you guys get a sense of what, Paul's trying to do. He's trying to convince that person in the synagogue who is self-righteous and telling them, do you not realize the judgment of God is impending on you? Do you not fear him? And he tells them, you're stubborn, you're unrepentant. Meaning, to the, just imagine the Jew sitting in the, in the synagogue, uh, um, you know, in synagogue gathering. He's just, you know, just sitting there thinking, you know, what, why are you shouting at me? 
I don't understand why you're saying I'm so under the judgment of God. I'm a child of Abraham. And Paul is just, just going at it. He's like, you don't get it, do you? You judge others. He's, trying, he's, he's using examples. You, know, you, you judge them for doing something, and then you go home and do, do it yourself. You're a hypocrite. Do you not realize you're under the judgment of God? You are a child of God's wrath. So you, you see what's going on? People in the church, when they don't get that, it means they're not converted. But when we get that, those of us who are converted, we can all write a testimony and say, testimony and say, yes, before Christ, I was under the wrath of God. Boom, and I'll sign it because I know that's exactly how I felt. And it seems like the more we live, the more we look back, the more clear it becomes, you know. And the day that we decided to believe in Christ, we realized despite the sin we committed, despite all the wrath that was coming upon us, Christ received it, and we were saved by His grace. Now, going back to Ephesians 2, I do have to just briefly mention an interpretive issue. Um, now, I don't think, like, as we were saying this, you, I don't think any of us were thinking, oh, what about babies? Right? I don't think any of us are thinking that. And it's good. We shouldn't be thinking that. But some commentators will say, well, <clears throat> should we talk about babies, you know, or little children? Um, and, and some say, well, since it says we're children of wrath, does that mean every child born, every baby born is born under the wrath of God? And if he dies as a baby, he will go straight to hell because he's a child born of wrath. There are others um, who say that while we are all born under the wrath of God, a child up to a certain point in their childhood, infanthood, <coughs> doesn't know um, morally right or wrong in terms of like self-control, understanding. And so even though they go around maybe sinning and sometimes even lying, um, like a baby, do you, you know, when you say, did you do that? Right? And that's the crazy thing, right? Parents, your own child, um, after, you know, you know, did you pick that? Did you eat that? <laughs> it's coming out of their mouth. They're lying right to you. Is God going to judge them for their willful, was that a will, volitional act of sin and defiance? Now, that is definitely a mystery because we can't, judge the child's heart at that point. Um, MacArthur uh, and also A.T. Robertson um, would say that uh, there's a certain point where the Lord understands that at that point they cannot make that willful choice to sin, even though they're sinners, uh, and his death would be graciously applied to them. Uh, there are certain passages. I'm not going to get into those passages right now. Uh, one in particular, I think MacArthur mentioned that uh, like when King David's son, his first son with Solomon, not Solomon, uh, when with Bathsheba died before Solomon, um, <clears throat> he said, um, I can't go to, he can't come to me, but I will go to him. Uh, clearly indicating that he knows that when a baby dies, he's instantly, the child is instantly transported into the presence of God and forgiven uh, because of what Jesus Christ did for those that he chose. Um so, but in this context, I don't think Paul was even intending for anyone to think that. Does that make sense? It's more of like a general theological reality that anyone who's converted will be able to look back and say, yes, I was once a child of wrath. And the point here today is that if you do not see that as clearly as we do, it means you are not yet converted, you are still dead in your sin. So we've been uh, delivered from that. When God resurrects us, okay, He destroys the power of that sin, of our flesh, of walking in, according to the course of this world. All of that is destroyed. We no longer follow the world. We no longer have 
desires for Satan. We no longer have desires to fulfill ourselves. Now, do we occasionally you know, fall into that? Do we sometimes forget to see things right and we become proud, right? Do we sometimes lose sight of the focus and we become materialistic, right? Do we sometimes get angry when we shouldn't get angry? Do we become complaining when we shouldn't get complaining? And do we sometimes fall in the lust of our flesh? Yes, but that's not walking in what? In sin. That's the occasional fleshly struggle that we sometimes fail in but that does not mean okay, we're walking in it because we can all say with a clear conscience, I have left the world. Amen? Yeah, it's, it's, our conscience is clear. It's, it, it's now being hypocritical. Okay? Now, if you continue to sin, yes, you should feel hypocrisy. But with a clear conscience, we can say we have left the world. We've left our flesh. We no longer are children of wrath. We're children of God. Let's pray. Father, we humbly pray for wisdom. Um, we thank you for reminding us of what we were saved from, what we were, what you have destroyed by resurrecting us. And we pray earnestly for those who might not be resurrected yet, that you would bring upon them the recognition, the realization, the understanding of their state, their, their plight, that they too will turn and believe and be reconciled and be forgiven and be resurrected unto life. And we pray, Lord, that in the many years of ministry at Titus, that the church, while it is slowly growing, would only be filled, Lord, with those who are truly resurrected, converted, Help us, Lord, never to compromise, trying to make the church bigger just by adding a bunch of people who are dead. But we pray, Lord, that as a church, we would truly be filled with people who are alive in Christ, who understand when Paul says, we too formally walked. Father, we thank you so much for the clarity of your word and for what you have done in us. In Jesus' name we pray.